sound that brings release. It's a, you know. Was to be a, that fourth beast. And he says that fourth beast was very ferocious, very wicked, very, and he says that fourth empire had ten horns. And then an eleventh horn came out which was pompous, which made noise. And when you look at that and you begin to understand the European Union and the coming together of the ten nations that made up the European Union, then you begin to understand that this fourth beast is what's happening in Europe. So the Roman Empire was a Caucasian empire. It was an empire made up of white people. <laughs> That's why I said I have to be careful because we're alive. I want to say a couple of dangerous things here. And I hope they don't kick us off the live broadcast, but it's okay. So they be, the Roman Empire became an in embodiment or an incarnation of the spirit of wickedness they embodied that's why they were the ones that were responsible for killing christians they had lions coming to eat christians they had people they used to take christians stick a christian at the end of a pole and use them as a lamp in the streets you know like we have street lamps the, the Roman Empire used Christians as lamps. So they were literally the light of the world. <laughs> so there would be Christians, uh, 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 poles with Christians, every few meters on the road, burning. It was a reminder to everybody and a warning to everybody that if you serve God, we will burn you like what you're seeing. It was a way of warning people not to become Christians. But what is interesting is in the midst of that level of persecution, the rapid acceleration of growth of Christianity was immeasurable. One of the emperors was heard to have said, why is it that the more we kill these Christians in the, in the circus here, the, they keep singing? Tell them to stop singing. They couldn't stop the Christians singing. They would... You'll be sitting there, standing there, and a lion is coming to eat you. And you're singing and worshiping God. That's the power of a true convicted Christian. The type of Christians that we have today, I, 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 oh, I couldn't come to church. It was raining. Oh, oh, sweet. It was cold. I couldn't come to church. Are you serious? Are you serious? You would not have survived as a Christian during that time, would you? With this wishy-washy, namby-pamby Christianity, the chair was too hard. The pastor preached for 15 minutes longer than he should. And I was hungry. Are you, are you serious? <sighs> you see, the destiny thing that we're talking about is worth fighting for you got to fight for it said so you got to fight for this thing it's not going to come to you and get handed to you on a silver platter you've got to be willing to fight if God calls you to do business you've got to be willing to fight for that business if God gives you a marriage you've got to be willing to fight for that marriage that's why we wrote a book fight for your marriage you've got to be willing to fight for what God has given to you when God gives you children, let me tell you, getting children is the beginning of a fight. Yeah. Uh -huh. You have to fight. You have to fight for your children. If you don't fight for your children, they'll come home one day and say, Mom, I'm now a them. Come on now. That's right. When you say them, who? You say them. Yeah. Because interestingly, in the Roman, this wicked empire that we are talking about, I think 95% of their emperors were gay. So, 
What, does, what, what, what is the purpose of me saying all of these things? Is I need you to understand the context within which you're building your business. The context within which you're building your purpose, your destiny, and your assignment. It's not a, and by the way, that fourth kingdom did not pass away. The Roman kingdom, according to the structure of the Roman empire at that time, was dissolved. However, the kingdom did not end. If your thinking is physical, you would have thought that the empire of Rome ended when the last Roman emperor came out of power. But when you understand the spiritual implications of what we're talking about, you then know that the emperor stepped out of power and the, and the, the kingdom in, in the physical form was dissolved. But the spirit of the fourth beast continues to reign. What did happen is it moved geographic location for a period of time from Europe to America. And how do you know that there was that transition. When you look at how the banks were built, when you look at how the architecture was built, when you look at how the infrastructure was developed in America, it was a copy of the systems that were implemented in Rome. Now, I don't have time because it's actually a whole two, three hour lecture to help you understand why those pillars are there at the whatever building uh, in Washington, why it's structured that way, why the eagle, and so on and so on. You'll see all of that. It is in scripture. It is verified by scripture. So I'm not just shouting things that are not in the word of God. I wouldn't have the boldness to do that because I am live. I've got the backing of scripture to say these things are factual and they can be proved. So the spirit of oppression and dictating wickedness moved from Europe and that same demon or principality now operated from its new headquarters which was America. So America became the superpower, global superpower controlling and dictating the economies and the economic environment of the world. Now, this then brings us to this whole thing that I was explaining the other week. Why is there pressure for de-dollarizing? Why is there pressure for BRICS, for SADC, for uh, AFTA, which is Africa Free Continental Trade Agreement, and all the other economic blocks that are being formed now? The reason all of this is important for you to understand is you're living in a period when Genesis chapter 14 is being repeated. And you can read Genesis chapter 14 and ask yourself, who am I in Genesis chapter 14? Because you can locate whatever spirit you are of in Genesis chapter 14. Every single one of you that are sitting before me here and that are watching live, we can locate you and the spirit of which you are of in Genesis chapter 14. Okay? So we find there all the kings. The four kings coming to fight against the kings. The, the five kings. So we are introduced to Chadaloma. We are introduced to, um, to, to, to Berah. We are introduced to all these wicked kings. Some that were pro-homosexuality, sodomy, and all these wicked vices. And some that were pro-military force and oppressing the people. Some that were pro-being uh, religious but in a polytheistic manner, worshipping a multiplicity of gods. So all of that is introduced. Then there's a man who's brought in, who's Melchizedek, and he's, he's working with a man called Abraham. And they're working to re re recover a backslidden believer called Lot. <laughs> so now here's the question. Of those people that I mentioned, which one are you? Who's coming out on top in Genesis chapter 14? Who came out as the most influential person in Genesis chapter 14? It was Abraham. Abraham. So that was telling us that this man Abraham 
overcame a whole system that was under a man who was running a nation whose name is Nimrod, running a whole nation, but that nation influenced the whole system. And that whole system was sodomic in nature, it was wicked in nature, sexual perversion, etc., etc. All of those things were normal in the environment. God raises up Abraham and he says, I'm establishing through you a whole new system that is totally against, totally opposed to this system. Are you here? You're good. Wonderful. Praise God. Having said all of this, what does all of this mean? The context within which you are living, let's put it in simple English. The context within which you are living as a believer is an environment that is absolutely against you. It's absolutely against the values and the norms of the kingdom. Everything is fighting against your marriage. It's fighting against your, your family. It's fighting against your children. It's fighting against your wife. It's fighting against your husband. It's fighting against anything that carries what we call the Judeo-Christian value system. So you're either going to do business according to Babylon or do business according to the kingdom. You're going to do marriage according to the Bible or you're going to do it according to Babylon. It's a choice. You're going to run your life and govern your life by the spirit of Babylon or you're going to run and govern your life by the spirit of the kingdom. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, glory to God. So having said that, let's talk about rebuilding. Rebuilding. In the context of this Roman system. I could say a few more dangerous things, but I'll say them next time. We're going to get into those conversations very, very soon and help you to understand that we are in a period where we're supposed to be rebuilding. Rebuilding and reestablishing the kingdom factor. And this is where the Nehemiah factor comes in. How do I rebuild in the context of all these things opposing me. How do I have a marriage that looks like a kingdom of God? Whoops. You're supposed to mute the sound. <laughs> I forgot to say. A bold dynamic. Equipping the nations with a bold dynamic message of economic empowerment. I love that video. Still not muted. All right. There we go. Our first scripture that we want to read quickly. Where are we going? Where is God taking us? What is going to happen in the days ahead? In the context of all this drama that I have explained. In the context of all the wickedness. I mean, let me tell you. The shaking has just begun. Amen. Amen. I said the shaking has just begun. Everything that is happening, interestingly, we've been able to speak it prophetically before it happened. The wars that are happening, the drama that is happening, the, what's happening now with Israel, all of it, we've been speaking it and telling you, get ready. And the result of what's happening now is going to be major economic upheavals. So you're going to need to get ready for that as well. Did you hear me? If you get caught unprepared, it's your fault. God is speaking to you. God is reminding you. God is encouraging you. Get yourselves ready. So there is drama at a global level. But it's different for the children of God. You and I are covenant children. You and I are supposed to be the Abraham in Genesis chapter 14. So you need to behave like your father. Bible says uh, there was that whole argument that the, the, the Pharisees had with Jesus. And he said to them, uh, why is it that you are wanting to kill me? And says, who wants to kill you? He says, hey, you guys, you are of your father, the devil, and the works of your father you will do. And they said, but we are, we are not born of, 
of fornication. We are of our father Abraham. And he says, if you were of your father Abraham, you would behave like Abraham. But you're not behaving like Abraham. You are behaving like the devil. So in this world, there's basically children of God that behave like Abraham or children of, of Satan that behave like Satan and all those other kings. There's no in-between. Which one are you? How are you raising your life? How are you setting your standards? So what will happen in the days that we are in? Jesus said, repent. The word of God says in Acts 3.19, repent. Now repentance is an interesting word. We believe repent means to be sorry, to be sorrowful. Say sorry, I, yes, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do it, this to you. That's not repentance. Repentance from a kingdom of God perspective means to repent means to turn, go back to the top. The word pent means top, like a penthouse. The Michelangelo Towers in Santon has a penthouse. That's the top floor. That top floor is called the penthouse, the top. So repent means go back to the top. So God is saying, where you are now, where you're operating now, is not where you should be. So he's saying, repent, go back to the top. Go back to your original place. Go back to your identity. Go back to who you are. You're a child of God. You're not a Babylonian. You're not a Roman. You're not a Greek. You're not operating by a wicked system. You're operating in the kingdom. So repent. Go back to the top. Go back to your identity. Go back to who you are. So the first key that we need to look at is this important word. Repent. Go back to who you are. Who are you? Do you even know who you are? Do you know the language you're supposed to be speaking? Do you know how we behave in this family? So it says, repent therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So we're supposed to repent, be converted. Times of refreshing will come from where? The presence of the Lord. So by repenting, you're going back to your original place which is the presence of the Lord we could have a little a whole conversation and explain what happened in the garden when the presence of God would come and Adam would have encounters we talked about that have encounters with God when he sinned he lost his place and fell from his place and God put cherubim that Closed the access back into the garden. But the only other place where you now see God reintroducing us to cherub is when he says you shall put cherub on top of the ark and the curtains that Dr. Francisca was talking about that were in the temple were to have images of the angels, the same angels that were in the garden. So when the curtain was rent in twain, the Bible says from top to bottom, man now had access to repent, to go back. So what Adam was denied in, in the garden of Eden, we now have access to repent, to go back to that presence because it's in that presence that we are supposed to operate. And times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing. We're resetting. We're reviving. We're rebuilding. 
shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send Jesus which before was preached unto you when the heaven, whom the heaven must receive until the times, the times, the moments, the seasons of restitution of all things. That's good. Which God had spoken by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began. So God has been speaking about a time, a period, a season where there will be restoration, restitution of what? All things. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Now the challenge is when we read some of these scriptures is our minds go into default religious mode of thinking that this is speaking about some special time, some time in the future when the sky shall be filled with glory and we shall see Jesus coming down with, a, with angels and he's on a horse and it, we, we defer it to a future time. But we sorted the time factor out on Thursday when we looked at the scripture in Revelation where he says, I heard another voice in, in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are English present continuous tense now and continues to be the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ that includes you and me and he shall reign forever and ever. So while the church is busy looking for the end of the world. And we're saying oh look there's war in Israel. There's war in Ukraine. And the Bible says when you see wars and rumors of wars. Then we know the end has come. And the prophets are prophesying that the end has come because there's wars. But you didn't read the scripture properly. He says when you see these things happening. Wars and rumors of wars and all this drama and earthquakes the scripture says the end is not yet it's in your bible this war doesn't tell us the end is coming so don't get excited and say yo we're right now going to heaven no we're going to be here for a long time How do we know the end is come? The Bible says this is how we know the end. This gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to all the earth. Then the end shall come. So you've been listening to a lie. Believing a lie for so long. Read the scripture properly. Wars are not an indicator that the end has come because God is still interested in those people that are bombing there. He's interested in them getting saved, hearing the gospel. He wants the Palestinians to hear the gospel. He wants some of those Jews that are fighting there in that war to also hear that J Jesus is the Messiah. He wants the gospel preached. He wants Joe Biden saved. He wants jo Dr. Fauci saved. He wants all these guys to be saved. As wicked as they are, they must hear the gospel. So until the church realizes that we have a responsibility to preach the gospel. Why must we preach? So that they can repent, come back to their original place. You know, there are a lot of people I don't like, but God loves them. And he wants them saved. I don't like Dr. Fauci. But it's possible that he may get saved somewhere and I'll bump into him in heaven and I'll say, why were you creating viruses? <laughs> Are we still alive? Okay. Just checking. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So...
Notice the closing part of that verse says, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So the prophets of God have been telling us there is coming a time where all things shall be restored. There's coming a time where all things will be put together. There's coming a time when the kingdom shall come and establish these things. And when John the Baptist uh, came, what was John the Baptist's message? Finish it off, finish it off. Repent. For the kingdom of God is here, it's at hand. In other words, that marked the beginning of the rest restoration. That marked the beginning of the kingdom takeover. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished. What is finished? All those things that the prophets have been saying. All those things that we've sought to establish. So right now we have a docile church waiting for a bell to ring as an indicator that it's now time for you to, to reign and rule and dominate in the marketplace. When we don't realize that the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension and the sitting at the right hand of the father, Jesus was declaring that the takeover has begun. Hallelujah. Praise God forevermore. Here's a little quote from the book. The story of Nehemiah is an amazing story that teaches us that we are united. Any goal can be achieved. If we are united, when you and I are united, any goal can be achieved. The Nehemiah factor, this is what we call the Nehemiah factor. In it, we see man tackling a great challenge and succeeding. He inspires a whole nation to regain dignity, courage, and hope for a better tomorrow. So Nehemiah, in essence, is giving us the other side of what we saw with the Nimrod factor. The Nimrod factor was, let's remain here as a people in the valley of Shinar. And let's not spread abroad and fill the whole nation. Let's just remain here. And God says, whatever they have purpose to do, they will be able to accomplish it. But in order that this agenda, which is against the plan of God, so that it doesn't win, let's go in and mess it up which was the birth of Babylon, Babel, which means, or Babel, which means confusion. So the confusion that was established was to spread people across the nations, but God wanted us, after getting spread across the nations, to then come together to unite and enforce the kingdom of God. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So when we are united, we can achieve anything. So when it comes to rebuilding the destiny of your family, of your, of your business, of your home, of our church, we must make a decision to be united. A family divided against itself cannot stand. A nation divided against itself cannot stand. A business divided against itself cannot stand. A couple divided against themselves cannot stand. Are you united? Are you clear? Do you understand what, he, what this is saying? You cannot build anything significant without the unity factor. John Maxwell said,